Hi everyone, welcome to my third vlog on skills versus capacities in speed, agility and change direction. In this vlog I will analyze a skill and capacity deficient speed drill, the flying 10 meter sprint and a change of direction drill, the 505. I will first analyze a skill deficient flying 10 meter sprint. As can be seen, the athlete displays a number of deficiencies in the execution of the drill. The first of these is that the athlete adopts an excessive forward lean of the trunk rather than maintaining a more upright posture. This in turn forces the athlete into a ground contact well in front of a center of mass. The athlete does this in order to prevent himself falling forward but it also acts to increase braking forces acting against him and increases the length of his ground contacts. These inefficiencies all act to dampen the athlete's ability to generate vertical impulse on each ground contact, which is crucial to maximum speed sprinting. The athlete also displays poor positioning of the swing leg on touchdown, rather than a figure four position with the swing knee in line with the stance knee. As we can see from this comparison to an Altus track athlete, the swing knee is in front of the stance knee on ground strike which in turn reduces the time needed to position the swing leg for the next ground contact. In order to rule out a capacity deficit, I assess the athlete's hip and ankle mobility as well as their reactive strength index. I used the modified Thomas test to assess the athlete's hip mobility. This was found to be adequate. A knee to wall ankle mobility test was used to assess ankle mobility and was also found to be adequate. These ruled out mobility capacity restrictions being an issue for the athlete. Pogo jumps performed on a jump mat were used to assess reactive strength index. This was found to be more than adequate and ruled out a reactive strength capacity as an issue for the athlete. Upon ruling out a capacity deficit, I used simple cues and technique drills to resolve the skill deficit. As can be seen in this after video, the athlete does a much better job of hitting desired positions. Using cues such as stay tall and high knees, we can see a drastic improvement has taken place. His trunk position is much more upright, which in turn has reduced the distance between ground contact and his center of mass. This aids his ability to generate vertical impulse on ground strike. His positioning of the swing leg is also much improved and more closely resembles the desired figure four position on ground strike. Figure four posture hold was used in order to teach proper positioning of the swing leg on ground strike. A march with the dowel was used to encourage the athlete to maintain an upright trunk by not allowing the dowel to drift forward and cueing them to stay tall. A skip was used to teach the athlete to strike the ground with force and under their center of mass, as well as cueing him to hammer the nail into the floor, the nail being the shin and the hammer being the contralateral arm. Wicket's drill was used to promote a vertical step down and in turn to teach the athlete to produce more vertical impulse on ground contact. In the following clip, I myself perform a flying 10 meter sprint. As you can see, I display several deficiencies, but I will just focus on one main issue as I believe this to be the main limiting factor. This is the actual position of my foot on contact with the ground. I strike the ground with what I would refer to as a limp foot rather than an actively stiffened ankle. In this comparison with another Altus athlete, we can see that there is clear daylight between the heel and the ground of the stance leg of the elite athlete in comparison to mine. I have previously ruptured my Achilles tendon in my left foot, which may be a contributing factor toward this possible strength capacity deficit. I attempted to cue myself to strike the ground with a stiff ankle and not let my heel hit the floor during an A-march drill, but as you can see, I struggled to achieve this even with these cues. The modified Thomas test and knee to wall ankle mobility test were again used to rule out any mobility restrictions. I displayed no obvious mobility restrictions in either test. However, upon assessing my reactive strength index through repeated pogo jumps, my RSI was found to be well below what was required to execute a maximal sprint efficiently. This was a clear indication of a reactive strength capacity deficit of my ankle complex. After identifying the capacity issue, I employed simple strength and plyometric exercises to address it. In this after video, I display some improvement in performance of the sprint. When we get a close-up image of my foot strike, 
I do a much better job of maintaining stiffness through the ankle complex on ground strike and in turn reduce energy lost. This is evident as you can see that my heel barely makes contact with the ground, indicating further improvement in stiffness through the joint. The eccentric calf raise, two up, one down, was used in order to improve eccentric strength and force absorption qualities of the Achilles tendon and ankle complex. Pogo jumps were used to improve the efficiency of the stretch shortening cycle and vertical force production. Hurdle jumps were used as a progression to improve vertical and horizontal force production as well as the stretch shortening cycle. The depth jump was used as a further progression targeting vertical force production and attempting to minimize ground contact time. Moving on to the 505 change of direction drill, I will analyze an athlete with the skill deficient performance of the drill. The first issue that I'll highlight is the deceleration technique he adopts. He uses his forefoot on each braking step rather than his heel. Due to this, he is unable to control the braking forces and this leads into the next issue of an inefficient cut at the line. In this comparison to an elite American football player, the body positions are somewhat different. The American football player's torso is leaning in the direction he intends to cut and is, has also adopted a lower stance. Whereas my athlete's torso is more upright and his centre of mass is higher, which in turn limits his ability to create adequate forces to change direction quickly. As we know from previous assessment, the athlete had no mobility restrictions. So, because eccentric strength is a key predictor of change of direction ability, I chose to test his one rep max eccentric box squat and Nordic hamstring strength so as to rule out a strength capacity deficit. The athlete was found to possess appropriate levels of eccentric strength in both tests. Also, from knowing the athlete's training background, I knew he possessed the required levels of strength needed to perform the drill more efficiently. As we see here, the athlete hits much better body positions during execution of the drill. By cueing him to use his heels to slow himself down and to get low when cutting, we see significant improvements made upon previous execution of the drill. The shuffle to stick drill was used to teach the athlete how to safely and efficiently decelerate in the frontal plane. The shuffle to cut drill was used as a progression to teach him how to cut safely in the frontal plane. The forward deceleration drill taught the athlete how to decelerate in the sagittal plane. The forward deceleration with cut taught the athlete how to cut in the sagittal plane. In the following clip, I perform a capacity deficient 505 change of direction drill. My execution of the drill leaves much to be desired. The main issue I have identified is the very large braking steps I use to decelerate my mass. Possibly this could be due to a lack of eccentric strength. However, when compared to the previous athlete's execution of the drill, mine appears much less efficient. I display similar faults to the previous athlete such as not lowering my center of mass enough during the cut, but also my braking steps are much larger than his. I try cueing myself to take smaller braking steps and to get lower when cutting. However, my execution still lacks adequate control despite these cues. As previously assessed, I have no major mobility restrictions of the ankle or hip. However, upon testing my eccentric strength of the hamstrings and quadriceps, it was found to be lacking of what is required to perform the change of direction drill competently. As the video shows, I have improved my execution of the drill somewhat. I achieved this by using simple strength training exercises to increase my overall strength, but more specifically to focus on my eccentric strength. When I compare it to my previous attempt at the drill, I am in more control during the deceleration phase using smaller, more frequent steps to decelerate my body mass. This in turn allows me to lower my center of mass to get into a more advantageous position to change direction from. Eccentric box squats were used to enhance eccentric strength primarily of the quadriceps, but also of the other structures of the body as well, such as ligaments and tendons. Band assistic Nordic hamstring curls, as well as eccentric focused Romanian deadlifts were used to enhance eccentric strength primarily of the hamstrings but also of other structures of the body as well. In conclusion, I have learned that athletes can present with issues that seem similar but on the outset require further investigation in order to achieve a successful outcome. 
This sometimes requires the SNC coach to take a different approach to an athlete who may have a capacity issue as opposed to an athlete who has a skill issue.